in human activity is the one influenced by information technology information technology is a very fascinating progress in the history of mankind it has various facets there are philosophical facets to it there is the legal facet to it and you also have the rights and obligations arising before the law this aspect of information technology which is fully influenced by the growth of technology and the development of technology has had an impact on various aspects of activity of mankind and therefore it is necessary for us to look at information technology in a holistic manner it is not a pure legal exercise it is not a pure philosophical exercise it is not a pure human relations exercise human relations law and philosophy are all combined together and influenced directly by the development of this unique technology namely the information technology as the name itself suggests information technology is basically a technology which revolves around the sharing of information amongst human beings amongst machines and machines and human being with this sharing of information becoming easier and easier day by day and the quantum of information that is being shared exponentially increasing day by day there are several risks that are associated with this technology which has endangered certain concepts and certain aspects of human activity which we took for granted it is this aspect of information technology and its impact on human activity that is causing certain alarm that is causing certain concerns and it seems to threaten the very existence of a honorable and decent livelihood it is these aspects of information technology which raises concern it has attracted the attention of legislators jurists lawyers and legal philosophers to find out as to how this information technology which has now become a integral part of our survival which has now become a inalienable part of our personality how can we ensure that this information technology does not endanger our basic and natural right to live a decent living don't intrude into my privacy was the statement in but they the statement you have violated my legal right to privacy this is the aspect of information technology which requires our immediate and serious consideration and i shall in the course of the next time few uh, next few minutes that is available to me delve on it in the context of this basic human right namely the right to privacy if there is one right which has evoked a lot of controversy which has been questioned that its existence itself is in doubt and can be compromised it is the right to privacy if there is one right if we may call it as that which has been directly intruded by information technology which is the right to privacy 
right to privacy has basically two aspects the one is the physical aspect the other is the non physical aspect namely the privacy in the matter of thought the concept of privacy is better understood than defined what was private decades ago has ceased to be private today it is affected the concept of privacy is affected by what is called as the time place and circumstance kala desha and vartamana what was considered to be perfectly a private affair years ago decades ago centuries ago today is no longer private what was considered to be perfectly within public domain is today considered to be a private affair not only has information technology invaded into the concept of privacy itself in these changing circumstances with the growth of business and the dealings between human beings all across the world with one and another privacy as a concept has now acquired a wider definition privacy in the matter of health privacy in the matter of finances privacy in the matter of my political philosophy privacy in the matter of religious thinking privacy in the matter of sexual preferences all these have now emanated as important subjects of discussion and requiring protection in the context of the uninvited guest namely information technology privacy remains and has still remained to be an undefined and unchartered course as i said lawmakers judges jurists lawyers are left astounded and dumbfounded being unable to fathom the extent and content in this unending journey into the unknown jungle of privacy right there are newer and newer ways by which technology is intruding into our affairs and any amount of caution any amount of care is insufficient for it is axiomatic that technology has always taken the lead and law has always followed technology mariner's compass help voyagers venture into open seas telescope help sky gazers to understand celestial objects microscopes have helped detect microorganisms medical science has almost fully depended upon technology to bring precision both in diagnosis and treatment but the advent of technology has complicated the understanding of this concept of privacy and made this concept obscure and illusory it is therefore necessary that we have to evolve new jurisprudence we have to evolve new legal principles in order to protect the onslaught on this right of privacy by information technology all the nations across the world all laws are now engaged in protecting this concern against the invasion by information technology on the right to privacy privacy has two connotations as i said physical and non physical non physical being privacy in the matter of thought as society evolved initially privacy was shunned as a concept 
there was no concept of private living people had nomadic lifestyle in fact security existed in being open transparent and communicative with one another everybody knew that everybody was knowing what's happening in their lives and was watching what is happening in their lives after the nomadic lifestyle there came settlement in habitants many of these habitants for example take the case of the kalahari bushmen who have been made famous by that movie the gods must be crazy did not have walls separating their habitants they were tribes for whom seeking solitude was a strange and a bizarre behavior surveillance was an accepted norm even the living huts had no walls within and exterior wall was meant to protect only from the elements not from the gaze of the fellow human being loneliness seclusion concept of confidentiality proprietary information freedom of thought confidence secrecy these were concepts which were unknown but today as a society has evolved these are concepts which are taken for granted and is within the larger umbrella of the concept of privacy some of these concepts are protected by law and some have come to be accepted as an inviolable social norm the concept of proper privacy has been differentiated between the rich and the poor in the ghettos of the poor or the slums of the modern day world the choice to keep private or not just doesn't exist it is illusory actually if we look at the concept of privacy as invaded by information technology privacy is the playground of the haves the concept of an egalitarian society and that of privacy seem strange bedmates the first concept of privacy in real estate was recognized way back in 1603 in what in the famous semens case the rule of england was taken over by the stuart dynasty by james the first in england at that time sir edward cook made the following statement that the house of every one is to him his castle and fortress as well for his defense against injury and violence as for his repose this idea mooted by sir edward cook has not remained in its pristine form given the evolution of society as a state with different ideologies now let us look at the another example of how right to privacy was recognized divorce law william pitt did copy the book gulliver's travels he is also infamous for having copied the unpublished letters of alexander pope alexander pope sued william pitt for this invasion into his 
private letters addressed by him which were unpublished. The court refused to give him any relief on the basis that he that the letters were unpublished. But the court recognized that Alexander Pope had a right to these unpublished letters on the principle of right to privacy. In fact, this has been referred to in the judgment of the Supreme Court of India in the privacy case, the Puttaswami number one, where the court looks at this evolution of law to say that from that stage, the seeds for right to privacy as a common law right, independent of the statutory right, did evolve. Having seen this, it is important now to recognize one other aspect of this law, which has become complicated by virtue of certain requirements of the security of the state. Private right must yield to public good. This is a well accepted principle. But to what extent can the right to information be used to invade right to privacy is a question which will never find a complete answer. An attempt to find an answer to this question is as good as to find an answer to the question how many grains of sand makes a heap. It all depends upon the requirement. It all depends upon the exigencies of circumstances. It all depends upon the extent of intrusion. But the fact is given that the state has the right to intrude into one's privacy and retain information which is required for public good. Like for example, we all know that information technology has made the transmission of information from one person to another or from one place to another seamless. It can be used by anybody irrespective of location, irrespective of race, irrespective of language, irrespective of any other resource as long as you have access to the technology that is required. A technology of this kind is akin to a knife in the hands of a murderer that knife can take away life but in the hands of a surgeon, that same knife can save a life. Similarly, information technology in the hands of right persons can be used for the upliftment of the society, for the good of the society, for flow of information from one quarter to another in order that the whole world progresses as a combined unit. But, unfortunately, this same information which, is, which finds its place on account of technology in the hands of a terrorist can destroy nations, can destroy humankind, can destroy economy. Fishing, for example, is an example, is a activity which can destroy economies. Private money can be stolen by hacking into one's bank account. These are aspects which require to be prevented by the state because when information reaches the hands of non-state actors, there is a greater danger of misuse than information in the hands of state actors. 
It is this aspect of the matter which requires very close attention as to how far should information be given to non-state actors and how far should the state have the right to information. For example, take our day-to-day -day life. Many a time when we switch on a computer, we have a long agreement that is required to be signed. And how many of us read that agreement before pressing the button accept? Virtually, I'm sure none of us even know what it contains. But we have virtually sold ourselves by pressing that accept button to a non-state actor and given access to all the information about ourselves. My habits in the matter of purchase, where I go, what is the type of entertainment I have, what is my schedule? What is my spending habit? Everything is now recorded. It is possible to conceive that marks left by physical activity can be erased. But surely it is not possible to erase a mark left by a by the information technology, by access to computers. It is this aspect which requires to be regulated by law and it is towards that end that all developing and developed countries have evolved laws to protect such right independent of the human right. Insofar as India is concerned, this right to privacy as invaded by information technology came up for a serious debate and consideration in the context of the Indian constitutional scheme in the before the Honorable Supreme Court, which delivered the judgment, which is often referred to as the privacy judgment. The question which arose in the privacy judgment was as to whether a right to privacy is a statutory right which is required to be conferred or whether it is a fundamental right flowing out of one or more of the articles contained in part 3 of the Constitution of India. After a detailed analysis, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion that the right to privacy is part of the fundamental rights enshrined in part 3 of the Constitution of India, more particularly Article 21. While it is true that Article 21 by itself does not have any special limitations, the fact of the matter is that an intrusion into privacy right is permitted by information technology if it satisfies a threefold condition, namely non-rivalrous, second, it is invisible, in fact, it has been described as the swiftest theft. And thirdly, that it is recombinant. Namely, that one data output can be used as input to generate more data output. That is the concept of recombinant. For example, we have Alexa at home. Take it that if you are discussing in the room where Alexa is kept about a possible vacation plan. In the next one week, you will have mails on your mailbox from several travel agents proposing tours and hoteliers 
proposing their results. How did the conversation in the privacy of my home reach somebody who is promoting their business? That is the concept of recombinant. One data input gives you a data output, which in turn gives you more data input. This is what has been explained in great detail as part of technology, information technology by authors. Now, if these three aspects of information technology is taken care of, then courts have held that such an intrusion into the right to privacy by the flow of information using information technology as a tool is permissible. But the question always remains, where do we draw the line? And one important aspect that we need to keep in mind is that information about myself is used by somebody else without my consent. I might have signed or accepted that agreement, but the fact remains that there is no consensus at item. In a, if it is a brick and mortar situation, such an agreement would have been struck down by courts as not indicating a consensus at item. For example, a uh, entry behind a laundry receipt which says that if there is a damage to any of the garments, the launderer will not be liable to pay more than rupees 50 as damages. Courts have taken the view that such a clause is unenforceable, that it is permissible for a owner of a garment which has been given to a launderer to sue the launderer for the cost of the government and damages. Is that, is that concept still a valid and current concept in the background of information technology, which does not seek my permission to use any particular information that is available on the net about myself? Marks left by information technology, as I indicated, are irreversible. You may delete a particular activity on your laptop. You may delete the activity on your computer, desktop, iPad. But there is always a remnant of your activity stored somewhere, which is accessed by somebody. That information is being used without your consent. Now, if that information is being used without my consent and inferences are drawn about me, my activity, my mental thought, is this not a serious intrusion into the right of a person? Obviously, it is. Has technology found a complete answer to this? Answer is no. On the contrary, technology is permitting such sharing of information. But are we able to do away with the technology? No. So we are in a catch-22 situation when it comes to information technology. To the extent possible, laws have stepped in to provide for safety and security against such an intrusion and the unauthorized use of information about individuals, groups, nations, and draw inferences. In fact, there is a very interesting uh, uh, write-up on this. If a person has accessed certain websites at one particular stage of his life, can you say that the person's mental makeup can be conclusively established and 
he could be talked about in that manner on the basis of the websites that he visited at one particular point of his life he might have evolved he or she might have different thoughts as one grows in life where is all this factored in by information technology obviously information technology cannot factor all this in it is therefore necessary that not only should there be restrictions on the use of information by state actors more importantly there should be restriction on the use by non state actors now there is another development that has taken place in so far as information technology is concerned that is the role that is played by institutions called intermediaries now intermediary is simply a platform on which one posts various information it could be photos it could be material it could be writings intermediary has no right or ability in law to screen or filter the information before it is put in in fact one concept which has evolved in information technology is the concept of net neutrality the manner in which the law relating to information technology and the thinking towards information technology is progressing is that intermediaries should not have any decision making power with regard to what is put on their platform if they do not have that information if that if they do not have that right then the there should be some outside agency which could step in to inform the intermediary about the content of such matter that is placed on their platform take for example google twitter facebook these are three important intermediaries all across the world and we use them regularly day in and day out with these three big players as platforms the question has arisen as to how we can prevent these platforms by being misused consistent with the principle of net neutrality this is another aspect which the law has dealt with and i shall go into it a little in detail when i take you through the provisions of the information technology act 2000 so far as india is concerned the another aspect is the legality the need and what is called as the proportionality with respect to the amount of information that is shared as i told you a while ago we have state actors and non state actors the amount of liberty that is to be given to state actors with respect to information that is available on the web with respect to an individual cannot be to the same extent as that is given to a non state actor a state has greater liberty and ability and right to access information than a non state actor how much should google be allowed to share information about my spending habit with a store do i spend a lot of money visiting bars do i spend more money visiting a vegetarian restaurant do i spend money buying groceries or am i a person given to spending on fashionable goods these are such valuable information which is available to a 
online store like for example amazon or flipkart they are able to use this information transmit it to those who need information and those who need to know my spending habits and you will start getting information from those stores about the product availability in their stores and that becomes a marketing exercise for them how much should all this information be shared by a credit card company how much all this information should be shared by a e retailer like amazon or flipkart how much all the information about me be shared by google or twitter or facebook these are questions which have engaged the attention of lawmakers and they will require their attention on a continuous basis because technology never stops digital footprints is the order of the day and if digital footprints is the order of the day then every attempt must be made to ensure that those digital footprints which can never be erased is at least prevented from being used now having told you about this concept of information technology vis a vis right to privacy before i go into the provisions of the information technology act which is relevant in the context let me deviate a little bit it is interesting to see how we have changed our thought from where we were decades ago to where we are today on a slightly philosophical note look at what rabindranath tagore said where the mind is without fear and the head is held high where knowledge is free where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls into that heaven of freedom my father let my country awake how does this gel with the concept of law of privacy is information technology destroying the boundaries the domestic walls and making the world flat contrast this with what the great indian scientist jagdish chandra bose said when he opened his laboratory in calcutta through regular publication work of the institute these indian contributions will reach the whole world they will become public property no patent will ever be taken the spirit of our national culture demands that we should forever be free from desecration of utilizing knowledge only for personal gain these are philosophical thoughts but we have to translate those philosophical thoughts into pragmatic ideas while we cannot do away with information technology while we cannot do away with e retailing while we cannot do away with being sharing information on the net accessing information from the net and we do it every day and we are doing it today we are all together because of information technology but we still have to see how this can be protected against misuse with this background let me take you through a few of the relevant provisions of the information technology act 2000 enacted by the indian parliament in from in the statute was enacted basically for four purposes namely to promote electronic commerce to storage of information three filing of documents four amendment to certain traditional laws like the evidence act because if you apply the evidence act as originally conceived a lot of 
matter that is now in non-material form would be excluded as evidence. Therefore, the Information Technology Act amended the Indian Evidence Act with the view to promote the filing of documents. For example, all of us file our income tax returns as e-filing today. Filings are done by corporates with the MCA. On the web web website, it is online. Nobody physically signs a paper for the purpose of filing an income tax return today. If I have to file an income tax return on or before the 31st of March or the 30th of September, as the case may be, it is filed and thereafter it is a, return, a signed uh, income tax return is filed. That has become possible by virtue of the development of technology in the form of digital signature. Digital signature has come to be recognized as a legal recognition of an electronic record by virtue of the Information Technology Act. There are certain acts which under law, under several laws, is required to be done only with the help of a material paper. For example, Did you ever conceive that there could be a prescription unless written by a doctor on a piece of paper which you take and present it to the pharmacist? The answer was, well, we never thought about it. But look at section 4 of the Information Technology Act. Where any law provides that information or any other matter shall be in writing, or in the typewritten or printed form, then notwithstanding anything contained in such law, such requirement shall be deemed to have been satisfied if such information or matter is rendered or made available in an electronic form and accessible so as to be usable for a subsequent reference. Now, section 4 has a non obstante clause. It overrides the provisions of every other enactment. For example, the Drugs and Cosmetics Act, which has Schedule H drugs, which can be dispensed by a dispensary only on the basis of a prescription written by a doctor. It is by virtue of Section 4 of the Information and Technology Act that today e-pharmacies have come to stay. I can order medication even a scheduled H drug sitting in the comfort of my home and it will be delivered to my home. This is how e-commerce is being facilitated by the Information Technology Act. Now, when we thought, when we talked about recognition of digital signatures, there ought to be a provision which authenticates an electronic record. That was provided by Section 3 of the statute, which provides that any subscriber may authenticate an electronic record by affixing his digital signature. And this has to be read along with Section 5. Uh, Section 6. Where any law provides for the filing of any form, application, or any other document with any office, authority, body, or agency owned or controlled by the appropriate government in a particular manner, the issue or grant of any license, permit, sanction, or approval by whatever name called in a particular manner, the receipt or payment of money in a particular manner, then, notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force, such requirement shall be deemed to have been satisfied. If such filing, issue, grant, receipt, or payment as the case may be, is affected by means of such electronic form as may be prescribed by the appropriate government. So, Section 6 of the Information Technology Act permits the use of electronic records in government and its agencies. That is how today you have e-tendering process. Every state government has an e-tendering portal 
on the basis of which tenders are invited and decided. You have income tax returns filed, MCA filings, and hopefully we will have filings through electronic means in court proceedings. And I that will be one of the good effects of the present predicament in which we are all placed. We now have, as I indicated to you some time ago, there is this concept of intermediary, which is very important. And we know that intermediary plays a very important role in information technology. They are big players. Now, intermediaries require to be controlled. Therefore, intermediaries were not to be given extensive powers and net neutrality had to be promoted. In this context, Section 2, Subsection W of the Information Technology Act defines the term intermediary. Google is an intermediary. Facebook is an intermediary. Twitter is an intermediary. They cannot control what is written on, them, on their platforms. Intermediary with respect to any particular electronic record means any person who on behalf of another person receives, stores or transmits that record or provides any service with respect to that record and includes telecom service providers, network service providers, internet service providers, web hosting service providers, search engines, online payment sites, online auction sites, online marketplaces and cyber cafes. Apart from, if you look at this definition, apart from Google or Facebook or Twitter, WhatsApp is a intermediary. As to what I write on WhatsApp, cannot be controlled by the company which owns WhatsApp. What I put as a picture on WhatsApp in my group cannot be controlled by WhatsApp. This is therefore an intermediary. In the context of intermediaries, it is important to look at one provision of the statute, namely section 79. Section 79 came up for discussion and for a, uh, on, on the basis of which the Supreme Court has rendered an important judgment and I will come to it. Before we go to section 79, I would like to draw attention to section 66 capital A and to section 69 capital A. 66 capital A of the Information Technology Act. made it an offense to send any information that is grossly offensive or has menacing character or any information which he knows to be false but for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience, danger, obstruction, insult, injury, criminal intimidation, enmity, hatred or ill will persistently by making use of such computer resource or a communication de device. Any electronic mail or electronic mail message for the purpose of causing annoyance or inconvenience or to deceive or to mislead the addressee or recipient about the origin of such messages. This, doing any one of these three is an offense under Section 66, Capital A of the Information Technology Act. The validity of Section 66, Capital A of the Information Technology Act came up for consideration before the Honorable Supreme Court in the celebrated judgment uh, in of Shreya Singhal. The Supreme Court went into the question as to whether Section 66A, which restricted certain information to be put on the computer resource and which made putting of such information a cognizable offense was constitutionally permitted. First and foremost, in Shreya Singhal, 
the supreme court recognized the position that the that a right of this kind affects or a prohibition of this kind in section 66a affects freedom of speech guaranteed under article 19 1a of the constitution having so accepted that position shea single then analyzes as to what are the types of restrictions that can be placed on this right in terms of article 192 of the constitution the court looks at article 192 and analyzes the same and holds that the permissible restrictions on the right under article 191a has to fall on one within one or more of the buckets specified in article 192 for example if you look at article 192 of the constitution of india 192 permits reasonable restrictions to be placed on the right guaranteed under article 191a only a such restriction falls within the one or more of the following buckets namely interest of the sovereignty and integrity of india two security of the state three friendly relations with foreign states four public order five decency six morality seven contempt of court eight defamation or nine incitement to an offence it is only if a restriction on the right under article 191a falls within one or more of the buckets specified in article 192 that such a restriction will be permissible the court examined section 66a and ultimately came to the conclusion that the restriction that was placed by section 66a was a restriction on the right under article 191a and did not fall within any one or more of the buckets enunciated in article 192 and therefore was unconstitutional 66a was therefore struck down by the supreme court in the context of 66a one other provision which the honorable supreme court examined was section 79 of the information technology act section 79 of the information technology act is a safe haven for intermediaries it exempts intermediaries in certain cases it provides that an intermediary shall not be liable for any third party information data or communication link made available or hosted by him but the protection under 791 is available to an intermediary only if the intermediary satisfies the requirements or the conditions enunciated under section 792 792 provides that the protection under 791 will be available only if the function of the intermediary is limited to providing access to a communication system over which information made available by third parties is transmitted or temporarily stored or hosted that is the role of the intermediary is limited to providing access nothing more or the intermediary does not initiate the transmission select the receiver of the transmission or select or modify the information contained in the transmission so it is 2a or b and the intermediary observes due diligence while discharging his duties under this act and also observes such guidelines as the central government may prescribe in this behalf the central government has prescribed guidelines that guideline is called the intermediary guidelines issued by the central government under section 793 and that also came up for consideration in shreya singhal's case 
let me point out to you what Shreya Singhal said about these guidelines. If you will look at the judgment of the Supreme Court in uh, Shreya Singhal, more particularly at paragraph 117, the Supreme Court read down the provision contained in 79.3b and came to the conclusion that it is the obligation of the intermediary under 79.3b is only where there is a court order directing the intermediary to bring down the content on their platform. If you will kindly go back to section 793b, you will see that on the face of it, 793b is worded in a very broad manner. The provisions of subsection 1 shall not apply. That is the safe haven under 791 does not apply to an intermediary. If the intermediary has upon receiving actual knowledge that the data is being used to commit the unlawful act but still does not take down the data from its portal. In other words, on a plain reading of that 793b, it appears that a discretion has been given to the intermediary to decide as to whether a unlawful act has been committed by a particular matter which has been posted on the portal of the intermediary. This provision was read down by the Honorable Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that this has to be understood as a order by the court to bring down the portal to bring down that matter from the portal. Unless there is an order from the court, there is no liberty given to the intermediary to itself decide as to whether a particular content on its portal is unlawful or not. Therefore, having read down the provisions of section 793b, the Supreme Court ultimately held that it is only when there is an order by a court that it can be brought down. Now, this requirement of an order to bring down a particular matter on the portal of an intermediary, which is a prerequisite for 793B to apply in order that the protection under 791 may be available to an intermediary. Because this is very important because all of us use Google, Twitter, Facebook almost on a daily basis. We put so much of information, we express our views, we make comments. So this is a very important aspect of information technology. And that is the reason why the Supreme Court went in great detail on this concept of reading down 793b and says it should be only by a court order. It cannot be that the, the uh, intermediary will itself decide as to whether a particular posting on its web website is lawful or unlawful. Now, this has given rise to a great controversy with respect to the powers of the courts insofar as the information that is put on the website, which is accessible anywhere in the world. Now, what if, if a particular information is available on the website, as we all know, it can be accessed by everybody anywhere in the world. Now, which court has the jurisdiction to direct that a particular matter which is hosted on the website of an intermediary, on the portal of an intermediary, is unlawful and therefore it should be brought down. Of course, we all know that in many of these cases, the person who puts the matter does not disclose he either his or her name or his address. 
it therefore becomes virtually impossible for anybody to know from where has this information emanated. That is the reason why we now have the concept, especially in the matter of internet related disputes. We have the concept of the John Doe orders. Of course, in India, we call it Ram Kumar orders. John Doe orders or Ram Kumar orders are passed by courts against unknown defendants. Now, in the context of the fact that the defendant is not known, the intermediary has a safe haven under section 791. Intermediary has no control. There is a requirement of a court order. Which court has jurisdiction? Does it mean that anybody anywhere in the world who can access the internet can go to that court and get an order? This has engaged the attention of a very, a, there's a recent judgment of the Delhi High Court on this point in relation to Ramdev, Baba Ramdev and his company, the Patanjali Ayurved Limited. There was certain material that was put against Baba Ramdev and his company on Google, YouTube, Google Plus and an order had already been obtained saying that those were defamatory. That those information were defamatory was not in dispute. But these intermediaries pull down those information only from within India. And the information continued to be published outside of India. Now the question arose, as to whether a further direction can be issued to these intermediaries to pull down all these material all across the globe. That took the court to answer the question as to whether it has jurisdiction to do so. The question was as to whether it is local geography or global geography. Answering that question, the Supreme Court, the Delhi High Court in this judgment of 2019 came to the conclusion that it is only where the information is put from the place, it is that court which has got the jurisdiction to pass what the Delhi High Court called as a global order. In fact, in uh, the in uh, in that case the court went uh, analyzed the argument that there cannot be extra territorial application of the provisions of the information technology act to affect the right of an intermediary to continue to host matter which has been declared to be wrong in a particular jurisdiction and the question was whether this dissemination of information all across the world could be prevented and the Delhi High Court came to the conclusion that it could be done. The other question that arose was as to how and where an uh, action could lie with respect to the guideline under the guidelines and under section 79.3b. The initially the view taken was that a court which had jurisdiction with any court where you could access the net and read that particular post had jurisdiction. There was nothing more that was required. If there was a defamatory matter put on the portal of a particular intermediary, then the law was that you could approach any court where you could access the internet and on that basis you would be entitled to get an order. That view was held to be wrong in subsequent judgments where the court came to the conclusion that merely because a particular 
information or a website was accessible at a particular place, it does not mean that that court has jurisdiction to grant any order. They came up with the, the principle that the website should be interactive. In other words, you should be able to promote your commercial interest, not purely by placing that information, but you should be able to actively work on that website on the basis of information which is available. And it is that code. For example, suppose I put a particular matter on Twitter. Well, somebody puts a matter, I can comment on that. Somebody else can make a comment on what I put. That is called an interactive website. If it is possible to have an interactive website, that court from where you can have that interaction will have jurisdiction not simply because you are able to view the website and read it, but because it is capable of being talked to. Then the question arose, is it enough if you are simply able to talk to it? The law advanced further. They said, no, that's not enough. The website on which the information is put should be addressed to that particular, the, what they call as a forum audience. The forum is a court. The audience is the audience or the people within the jurisdiction of that court. Now, is it put there only for the purpose of addressing the forum audience? For example, let me explain as to what I understand by this concept of forum audience. Now, a particular person is has a reputation, has a business in a particular place in Delhi. Sitting in Chennai or Bangalore, I put something which is defamatory of him. He may be residing in London. Can he or can he not find a action in Delhi because that particular information which I have put about him, which is viewed in Delhi, where he has a substantial business interest or has a reputation, can he or can he not sue in Delhi, even though he may be staying in London? I might have put that matter from Bangalore. The answer is yes, because that information is addressed to the forum audience, namely the audience in Delhi, because I know that he has a business interest or a reputation in Delhi and I want to destroy it. Therefore, an action will lie in Delhi, not because somebody views it in Delhi, simply views it in Delhi, because there is the entire object or the intention of my putting that information is to damage his reputation in the place where he has that reputation. It is in that context that we, the jurisdiction of a court has to be determined. In fact, there are a number of judgments on this aspect and I shall not trouble you with the others which you can look up and many and most of them are referred to in the recent judgment of the Delhi High Court in uh, Baba Ramdev's case. It was a case filed by Swami Ramdev versus Facebook Inc and others. Now, another aspect of the Information Technology Act which is uh, relevant is the amendment that was effected to the Evidence Act. The amendment was affected by section 16 by section 91 of the Information Technology Act, which amended section 59, section and added 65A and 65B to the Evidence Act. As to what should be done by a party 
in order to have the evidence, electronic evidence, admissible in a court as opposed to physical or material evidence, has been explained in detail by the Supreme Court in the case of Anwar versus Bashir, reported in 2014, where the Supreme Court has enunciated in full detail as to when a person can take the benefit of Section 65 capital B of the Evidence Act. I shall not go into the detail, but I shall leave it to those who are interested to look at the judgment, which will help all of us as practitioners to follow the due process, due process of law in order to ensure that the evidence which is in electronic form is admissible under the Evidence Act in a judicial proceedings. Friends, I have now gone into several aspects of the benefits and demerits of information technology. We have come to a stage in our lives where it is impossible to live without information technology. We now therefore have to come up with provisions which protect our rights consistent with the demands of the present day commerce and lifestyle. Informa the Information Technology Act of 2000 is one step in that direction. On the basis of Information Technology Act and on the basis of the judgment of the various courts, the government of India has also come up with the Aadhaar Act, which as you know has been upheld in substantial part, excepting in relation to non-state actors. Aadhaar Act has been upheld by the Supreme Court in Puttaswami 2. We have come to live with all this and we now have to be aware of our rights and limitations. It is therefore necessary that each of us exercise prudence in the matter of how we use this delicate tool, delicate tool and use information technology for the benefit of all. The one other aspect that I should point out to you is this concept of extraterritoriality of a legislation. There is what is called a geo-blocking and global blocking. And geo-blocking is blocking within the jurisdiction of the court. And you have global blocking, which is a blocking all across the world by a court having a limited geographical jurisdiction. This is a very sensitive issue because it raises issues of comity of nations, conflict of laws, and most importantly, the extraterritoriality of the application of a law or of uh, orders of a court. Now, Extraterritorial application of the Information Technology Act has been specifically provided for in Section 79 because it talks about computer resource. A computer resource has no territoriality. The order is addressed to the computer resource under Section 79, read with the guidelines. It is not addressed to the party. The computer resource, no doubt, is in the control of the party, but the order is against the computer resource under Section 79. Now, a computer resource is not different from India, is not different from a European country, is not different for, a, uh, for America, it is not different for any other country. It is the same computer resource that is used. Now, therefore, if an order is passed blocking a particular computer resource, that order will take effect all across the world independent of where the 
computer resource is being used or is being viewed that is the concept of global blocking and today indian courts have accepted the concept of global blocking and they have refused to accept a plea by intermediaries to the effect that well i do not have control over what is happening in a different country and therefore i am not going to take responsibility about what is being published elsewhere or to say that you a court in india does not have power to pass an order asking me to pull down something which is now being hosted by on my platform in a different country that argument has now been set at rest that's a very important development in the law in so far as intermediaries are concerned because i think the most crucial aspect of information technology act according to me which affects our livelihood is the role of an intermediary because we use this so often and it is therefore important and any amount of emphasis on this safe haven that is given under section 79 as part of net neutrality is not misused it can't be used for the purpose of doing unlawful acts it is therefore important that we do give a lot of thought to the role of these intermediaries i have now given you a birds eye view of what the law relating to information technology is this is food for thought i must confess that it is not an exhaustive presentation on the law or the subject for two reasons one i must confess that my knowledge on the technology itself is limited secondly this is such a dynamic field that what is good today becomes obsolete just a couple of weeks from today when we will have to find new ways it is actually a case of white spy versus black spy thank you very much for your patience and i acknowledge with gratitude you are having joined this webinar and i hope i have been able to share some of the thoughts that i had on this important aspect of law namely information technology act which influences ev the life of every one of us rich poor literate illiterate urban rural independent of geographical location race religion caste or creed thank you very much thank you very much sir it was a very informative session and we all enjoyed it thoroughly uh, if you have a little bit of time there are a few questions that we would like to ask you that yeah. our uh, listeners have posted here i'll read them out to you yeah one by one first one is from one mr vedavel yes california has brought the consumer privacy act that permits the users the right to know what personal data is being collected about them whether their personal data is sold or disclosed and to whom and to say no to sale of personal data access to personal data and request a business to delete any personal information about a consumer collected from that consumer will such a legislation possibly prevent non state actors from infringing yes in fact the uh, in india we still don't have a law but the data protection bill is now uh, referred to the select committee of the parliament and that law provides for express consent being taken before data is shared we still don't have such a data with us so next question is from mr ms krishnan if the click wrap contract says we are waiving our rights to privacy and such a contract also says that the data based on the use of information by us can be used for any purpose will such a contract be against public policy and is there any precedent on this point i would not think it is against public policy for the reason that i think that it is a personal right and if a person has waived his or her right to privacy i do not think that public policy will come into play there thank you sir the next question is from mr atif 
how do you reconcile the dichotomy between the right to censor inflammatory or genocide posts on intermediaries like in Myanmar with their obligation to not control or censor posts like you said in light of net neutrality and how does the states ensure this line is drawn and complied with by non-state actors? Well, uh, there, there, was uh, there was a similar situation that arose. There was an order that had been passed against Yahoo in a, by a French court which prevented Yahoo from uh, from putting on their platform material which was pro-Nazi, which also promoted the sale of Hitler's autobiography, Mein Kampf, which also had some posts which was anti-Semitic religions. The French court granted an injunction. We know why the French courts do it. French is a civil law country and uh, they have strong views on uh, these matters and the question was as to whether this could be enforced in a United States court. Yahoo approached the US court, I think it was, they approached the district court in California and contended that this type of an order was unenforceable in the United States by virtue of the First Amendment. The U.S. court took the view that the order that had been passed by the French court has to be tested on the anvil of the law in the United States. And when so tested, that order did not stand the scrutiny of the First Amendment and therefore was unenforceable. Now, therefore, the answer to the question is as to whether such an uh, such material which is offensive can be prevented has to be answered with respect to the laws of the country where it is sought to be enforced. And it cannot be answered divorce the law of that country. For example, if, a, if a, we have section 13 of this civil procedure code in this country where if a judgment is passed by a foreign court, the only method by which you can enforce it unless it comes under the purview of section 40, uh, 43 or 44 of the CPC is if you get a decree on the basis of a foreign judgment. Now that decree will not be granted unless that foreign judgment is in accordance with the law of India. Therefore, the answer to the question is that the order of that kind can be passed only or enforced only if it is in accordance with the laws of this country. And Having regard to the judgment of the Supreme Court in Shreya Singhal, which has elevated a right to post views on a portal of an intermediary to an aspect of Article 19.1a, my view is that it will not be possible to prevent such a posting. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Yudish. What if a foreign national comments something absurd in an interactive website? Then can we bring action against him or her and where? The, 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 the law as it appears to be in play is that you cannot sue unless in, in, in a court unless that court has the has, has some direct nexus to the cause of action. Namely, it should be an interactive one or it should be targeted to the audience within that court. It's simply because a foreign national has put it, has put something on the web. I cannot say I looked at it in my village and therefore I sue him here. That seems to be the law as now prevalent in this country. So next but question is from Ms. Aishwarya Vaidyanathan. Does the personal data protection bill create a sort of monopoly since all personal and non-personal data are under the purview of state agencies? Well, it could. Let us trust the state. Yes, sir. Next question is from Mr. Hitesh. The best, the best uh, cash box and the safest uh, chest is the state. Yes, sir. Next one is from Mr. Hitesh. 
with reference to section 1 subsection 2 read with 75 of the information information technology act when an offense punishable under the it act 2000 is committed by a foreign national outside india using a computer network in india how does the adjudicating officer take cognizance of such offense in absence of any treaty or binding law between the concerned foreign nation and india well that, that uh, it requires I agree. I agree that it requires a, a treaty to be entered into between two countries, and it only then that an action can be taken against a foreign national, and the basis of uh, with the help of uh, the Interpol and possibly at some point of time extradition. Yes. The next question is from Mr. Anirudh. A tweet is put up in country A. In accordance to whose laws the tweet is perfectly permissible? The effect is felt in both country A as well as Chennai. According to Indian law, such a tweet is impermissible. Will not a global blocking order violate the principle of comity of courts? Well, that's exactly the theme of our consideration in Ramdev's case. And the Bombay Delhi High Court took the view that it does not violate the concept of comity of nations or comity of courts. And it is and since that court has jurisdiction and the order is against the computer resource, an order can be passed. Unless the intermediary is able to show that the removal is beyond its power or capability. That is a, that, uh, uh, there's a detailed discussion on this aspect in Ramdev's case. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, next question from uh, Mr. Hari Prasad DG. In the data protection bill supposed to be passed in India, there is a presumption of deemed consent similar to that in the GDPR Europe. I hope it might have a severe impact on the right to privacy in India when compared to that of Europe, which is a rather informed society. What is your opinion on that with insights on prospective validity of the provision and changes that be required? Uh, in a situation where it is absurd to presume knowledge, in my view, would be invalid. Especially in a country like India, where these are not understood, these are not read, and simply to show that there is a deemed consent, because you have accepted a particular agreement or use a particular website. In fact, the, the moment you log in, some, some of the websites say you are deemed to have accepted the terms and conditions of our uh, portal. In my view, that would be open to serious challenge in a country like India as opposed to a more literate society in Europe. So with your permission, one last question, sir. Uh, from Mr. From Ms. Vinuta Raya Durk, uh, how does one execute or enforce John Doe orders in India? Oh, John Doe orders, yeah, you get an order uh, against an unknown defendant, and then, then you need to go and keep searching for the persons who violate the injunction and then serve the injunction on that person, implead that person in the court and get an order, a final decree. That's the way John Doe order is enforced. You, you have a John Doe order, you go in search of persons who have affected your right, which is in violation of the order of injunction that has been granted by the court. You serve that order of injunction on that person, get his details, come back to court, make him a party and get someone's issue from the court to him. And then he has a right to participate in the court proceedings, including asking for vacating of that order. That's the way a John Doe order is enforced. So, uh, Mr. Anirudh has a follow-up question with regard to his question on a tweet that is put up in country A, which is permissible there and in Chennai. The follow-up question is that if the same person first approaches the courts of country A and an order of injunction is refused, will the position be different? Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't get the purpose of the question. Yes, I'll read the entire question once again. A tweet is put up in country A 
in accordance to whose laws the tweet is perfectly permissible. The effect is felt in both country A as well as in Chennai. According to Indian law, such a tweet is impermissible. Will not a global blocking order violate the principle of comedy of course? This was his first question. To which in, my answer yes, sir. In the same factuation, if the person first approaches the courts of country A and an order of injunction is refused, will the position be different? The position would be different if the court, which is approached a second time, has effective jurisdiction over subject matter, in which event the order refusing an injunction by that court according to laws of that country would not simply be valid in this country if the laws of this country is different from the laws of that country. If the laws in Chennai is different from the laws of a foreign country, merely because the foreign country has refused an injunction, that does not mean that a Chennai court will automatically refuse the injunction unless the court comes to the conclusion that the laws in Chennai and the laws in the foreign country are one and the same and therefore it would operate as res judicata in common law or what you may call as an issue as trouble. So uh, as you know, we have gone live on Facebook also. There's one question from the comment section from Facebook that I'd like to ask you. And with yes. that, we will uh, end our seminar. The question is, uh, re one Mr. Pawan Kumar Rao, he says that recently I have come across a situation where the cybercrime police, upon receipt of a complaint for a fraud, committed over a private individual using UPI platform by another fellow user for a petty amount, froze the account of a financial intermediary by making them a party to the criminal case where huge monies and the business Uh, can I answer this question? Yes, sir, please. Am I being heard? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I think that this is a clear case of misuse. Misuse of the provisions of the uh, statute. So, I don't see a question of law arising out of interpretation of the provisions of the statute, but it is question, merely a question of how the law is being misused by certain parties. Thank you, sir. I think we've exhausted most of the questions. Thank you very much. It has been such a pleasure listening to you. I'm sure all of us have been benefited greatly from this. Thank you so much, sir, for being part of this and encouraging us to keep doing this further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Beautiful. Thank you.